The name of my uh, presentation is Using Simulations to Develop Deep Understanding in Science and Mathematics. My name is Isla Din, and I'm American trained with a master's in science and education. I'm currently working at the American International School of Abu Dhabi. I'm a math teacher, D, mathematics teacher, and science teacher. Um, I had talked about, and I hope that you all can hear me now, about the idea to define happiness. And so I'll just give you a second to start to think about what makes you happy. And I'd like to kind of turn to uh, an author, his name is Mark Manson, and he has basically self-help books that have nothing to do with science and mathematics, but more about quality of life. And he talks about and says the following, problems are constant in life. Problems never stop. They merely get exchanged and are upgraded. Happiness comes from solving problems. The key word here is solving. To be happy, we need something to solve. Happiness is therefore a form of action. It's an activity. Happiness is a constant work in progress because solving problems is the same. The solution to today's problems will lay the foundation for tomorrow's. True happiness occurs when you find problems you enjoy having and enjoy solving. A good life is not a life without problems. A good life is a life with good problems. Happiness is definitely solving problems. And I think you all can agree if you reflect on um, having your beautiful students in your classroom or even online, and if uh, there's any opportunities to solve problems and they actually are able to conquer them and solve them, there's hopefully a, a really kind of empowered feeling and a, and a happy feeling. Uh, that you can't replace. Uh, and so it's really amazing to think that happiness is truly solving problems. Of course, we have some problems of our own as educators. Uh, we have COVID-19, of course, still in the works. We're, we're ready for it to go, and we know it will go one day. Uh, and until then, though, we have to work on dealing with the uncertainty of face-to-face -face or online, given the circumstances, um, the, the needs of your bubble, the health needs of your students, safety first, of course the need to provide teaching and learning experience that are equitable and accessible for every child, whether they choose online, they choose face-to-face, -face, or whether they choose a blended situation. Uh, the need to provide inquiry-based lessons that put your students in the driver's seat to construct their own understanding and make sense of science and math with hands-on experiences. And I'm sure you'd agree with me that there that is very limited in terms of trying to think of really, really, you know, getting the kids' hands dirty in terms of um, connecting to math and science experiences. And it's hard to carry out hands-on experiences, even if the kids are face-to-face, -face, as we try to deal with uh, this year's even uh, limitations of so social distancing. Of course, uh, another problem that I'm happy to solve, and I'm sure you're all with me, is, is that we have to and we need to work on further developing STEM skills in our students. And it's, of course, obvious to know that the future jobs, 75% will involve um, STEM uh, skills. And uh, of 15-year-olds, the data shows that a solid 42% are not proficient in mathematics, 35% is not proficient in science, and there's a good solid 35% that are not proficient in technology, and we need to change that. And that, again, of course, is a happy problem for us to solve. Um, our STEM students, uh, our scientists and our mathematicians, we need to develop them as strong problem solvers. Um, as we think about that, we need to definitely think about how our scientists and mathematicians can observe phenomena. Uh, we know that scientists uncover uh, and try to answer the question, does X affect Y, whatever those specific quantities are or variables are, and they usually do that through investigations. Uh, mathematicians also uncover the relationships between two quantities as they observe phenomena. And usually that also is X and Y. And then they develop and understand patterns and correlations that exist between those. Um, and these are, of course, very rich ideas in terms of um, the skills involved behind being a strong scientist and mathematician in, in our classrooms. Um, definitely, though, uh, COVID or no COVID, I keep on telling my students that the show must go on. Um, and your, your students and my students, we, we all have to take care of them uh, and time doesn't stop and we need to make sure that we still can offer these rich experiences for our students. 
Um, and so really now I want to just kind of move forward and think about what is happiness now for me. And I hope that for those of you who have experienced gizmos or, or are planning to experience gizmos, happiness is solving problems for students now too. And happiness for me is using gizmos in the classroom, which is basically inquiry-based simulations. And I hope to connect you more to them as we move along. Um, and so when you think of simulations, I just want to introduce gizmos to you. Uh, what is gizmos for those of you who are unfamiliar? It's basically simulations that are digital fun, color, colorful and interactive, and they allow the students to investigate and problem solve. Um, there's high vis visualization, focus on modeling and math and science. They put the students in the control. They allow students to pick their own variables and complete multiple trials. Um, they're actually, the students are actually able to change uh, certain quantities and then actually observe the result of changing quant qualities, quantities and they actually can do more than one trial uh, and I'm going to show you as we move on how um, Gizmos produces uh, data and there's an opportunity to analyze data. So many rich tasks that are that are um, at your fingertips whether it be online or, or in the classroom. Um, many of these labs are online versions of pencil paper labs from years ago without a mess or any need for time. Uh, in other words, it's very, very efficient. Um, and it's really nice. Sometimes I even screenshot the data that's offered in Gizmos and I include them in tests and quizzes to see if kids really understand what they were doing in the actual activity. Uh, and it's aligned to our curriculums. Um, and it, it, uh, Gizmos does a great job in doing that. Even if it's British or an American, there's uh, definitely alignment. And it's perfect to use in a blended classroom, face-to-face -face or online. Um, what I've been finding, and of course, I know all of your students, uh, there's a reality. And of course, I have, I have my own children too. Um, there are distractions. You've got Snapchat, you've got YouTube, you've got gaming. Um, but I do find that when I present at Gizmos, I have 100% buy-in. Kids are ready to pull up their sleeves and get interactive and make sense of what's being presented to them, which is absolutely um, a flawless quality to have, especially in the classroom. Um, and it also encourages productive struggle, uh, and it really does help to persevere and seek more. Uh, we really, of course, in, in the classroom, we want to develop a perseverance culture, whether, again, it's in the classroom or online. Uh, and we want to present rich tasks as formatives. Uh, and, we, and we're not afraid to spend a whole class period on one problem with the philosophy of having depth, not breadth. And of course, we want to empower students to thrive in productive struggle. And that's, of course, the quality we want to develop for our kids as we develop them for college and career readiness. And that's for someone in grade three, nine, or 12, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we definitely want to create a perseverance culture. Uh, we want to focus on grit, um, getting our kids to be resilient and adaptive, um, and giving them opportunities to develop and investigate is, is, is the key to that. So when we think of productive struggle, I really like this visual. When you look here, there's no struggle. It's just automatic. It looks like this is probably a DOK1. There's a quick response giving an answer. Uh, destructive struggle is when this, the child is completely like zoned out and not connecting at all. Might be the task might be a bit too hard for them, um, or there's less interest in the actual task. And when you look at productive struggle, there's so much going on. There's discourse, there's collaboration, and it's so nice in the technologies that we have now for doing online. We can go into breakout rooms, do gizmos with uh, with a group. Uh, even though they're right a, a distance away from each other and of course have group conversations and discussions in the classroom with the gizmos with the productive scratch struggle as well and of course uh, before i get into the gizmo um, it's so nice to see how gizmos has been developed to when you think about rich tasks and how um, you have vygotsky's zone of proximal development and how the productive struggle is while it's real it's also very attainable um, because I honestly feel that Gizmos has a low floor and a very high ceiling. It's, it's highly accessible for all learners and it's excellent for differentiation where students can feel comfortable uh, and still grow uh, and not feel like it's too easy or not feel like it's too hard. Um, before I get into actual showing you the, the simulations, um, I had asked a student uh, over the summer to 
after we had gone through a very strong gizmo simulation that I use as an anchor to develop understandings on how to conduct an investigation, a scientific investigation, uh, using the plants um, experimentation uh, simulation that I will show you, I asked my student to actually construct a video on her experience and I had no input in it whatsoever and she was very kind and said she was happy to do it and I gave her a time limit as well so I think it's under two minutes so I'd love for you to connect to her experience um, being uh, virtual and connecting to developing herself as a scientist. Using gizmos as a student. Eighth grade was my first year being virtual for the majority of the times. There were limitations for each class subject, and then there were ways we could loosen the limitations. We were introduced to gizmos pretty early on in the year. Science was always a subject of my interest, and part of it was the involvement I felt that I had performing any sort of experiment. During the last project of the year for science, we were introduced to lab reports and were taught that they would be a reoccurring concept during high school. It seemed pretty overwhelming, but we were provided a template and some guidance. Gizmos was a great way to introduce ourselves to the independent variables, dependent variables, as well as many other components of an experiment. We had the ability to manipulate many parts of the plant simulation experiment and analyze the effect of different things on the height of the plant through the given data. As a developing scientist, balancing the performance of the experiment with the data we were meant to gather could be overwhelming. Gizmos made this extremely easy and clear through the data charts and the accessibility. I think Gizmos is a considerate implementation for online students, especially. Recent circumstances could make it difficult to gather your own supplies or accurately perform any sort of experiment. Interacting with the website and discussing results was refreshing after a year of a lot of listening. So overall, Gizmos is a great online source for students of this generation. Thanks. Um, I would love your feedback, but I don't think I'm able to interact with you. Um, so let's just move ahead now and using gizmos oh, as a sorry uh, I'll just move ahead and kind of talk about um, the experience of using this gizmos and and how I constructed it to get kids as far as I'm concerned to become super strong as scientists to develop a scientific investigation so I had this final summative goal uh, to have the students create a written science lab report um, and the lab report had to reflect um, a kitchen lab. So they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and they had to, in the process, uh, not just construct the lab report, but actually take a video of it as well and communicate to their audience. And within that, I wanted them as scientists to develop their testable question, to develop their hypothesis, um, to develop their independent dependent variable, control variables, differentiate between their experimental group and the control group, uh, show an actual time lapse if possible of their investigation, and actually create uh, a graph and analyze it and come up with their conclusion and decide whether their hypothesis was right or wrong. Um, and really, I would say it was kind of at first. Um, Right. As, even as an educator, you're like, this is going to be hard when I'm trying to do this all um, online. Uh, there's a uh, time like I've I've dealt with some of my students. I didn't see them. I haven't. Our students that in our middle school, some of them haven't come to school for 18 months. Um, and so when you start to think about the opportunities you have in the classroom and being able to like actually do simple experiments in the classroom, um, it was a bit daunting to think about the struggles that I would experience. But on the contrary, um, by using gizmos and having kids first learn about these concepts, and I had like an actual lab report that I, I, I showed, and I think uh, in the video they showed that too. Um, and, and so I went through the lab report on how do you construct a, a proper formal lab report, because of course I want to get my students ready for high school science courses like heavy chemistry, physics and biology, as well as think about the end in mind, which is uh, like even doing IAs for an IB uh, class. Um, it's quite incredible to see how at first when I showed them the lab report format, uh, it, it was daunting, I'm sure, for them. But then, of course, as we started to connect to gizmos and they were presented with these with the, the plants and, and being able to manipulate them into 
to identify what the independent variable is and to decide on what they wanted to measure and then to make sense of it using the simulations. It became fun, it became easy, it became attainable, and they learned so much from it. And the consequence afterwards, when I actually had them construct their actual um, summative and, and go out on their own and do their lab report, I was blown away by what my beautiful 12 and 13 year olds created. And I am more than confident now that they can move on next year to grade nine science and be a rock star and have such a strong foundation on these really important con these concepts that of course uh, make them strong scientists. Um, and of course that's the goal. So um, quickly I can just show you um, I gave them this uh, summative assessment. Before that, though, is the formative, and the formative was using gizmos. In the end, like I said, I wanted them to be able to do all these things. Um, I did teach them uh, this um, and gave it to them as a strong anchor. And I really want to encourage you all to have something like a really strong anchor that they keep on referring to as they're trying to make sense of how to conduct an investigation. And when I constructed this as well, it's this kind of a document that I've worked on over the years. Um, and I've also been mindful of IB. Um, and so when I think of IB and I think of those uh, incredible IAs that are 14, 15 pages long that reflect one uh, personal investigation, I tried to put those components inside, but then make it like simple for the grade eights to follow, but also make it as a really strong anchor for um, for them to like uh, rely on as they develop their skills and further investigate as they move up into high school. Um, with that being said, um, let's get to the gizmos. Let me show you. So here we have uh, growing plants. And what's really nice is I see the simulation as having a very low floor and high ceiling. And what I mean by that is um, I know that there's classes of grade threes that use this. There's classes of grade eight that use this. And I know even I was looking into some of the um, supplemental resources that Gizmos provides. And there's even input from grade 10, grade 11 teachers that use this as well. So it's really neat to see how um, accessible this is for so many students. So what you can do is, and I'll just be brief because I know I'm limited in time, but if you want to do an independent variable by changing the, di the different type of bean being used, you can actually um, manipulate it by picking tomato, bean, and turnip. And then you can start to think about what are the uh, things that you want to hold constant? Well, you want to have the same amount of water. You want to have the same amount of light. Uh, maybe you want to put fertilizer in every one. And so you can have good conversation with your students in terms of um, controlled variables versus independent variables and how you need to only change one thing. Um, and then what's beautiful about this is that I don't have to mess up my classroom. So even honestly, like if I'm in the classroom with the kids, I'm going to use this as well because, of course, you know that with growing plants, it's, you know, a, a bit unreliable and there's always things that can happen and it becomes quite a mess and we're limited in space. Um, and this just takes care of it on its own. And so what I can do now is I all I need to do is press play and then I can start to look at the data and make sense of the data and see what the results are when I grow different types of beans. And as you can see, it moves up day by day by day. We can pause at any day to stop and make sense of the data. And it goes to day 50. And I know that uh, for a lot of us to do this for 50 days would be uh, quite a task. Uh, and so it's great to see that over a few seconds we can cover 50 days. And now you can start to see the results. 
And you can start to make some decisions too. And of course you would do this all in a pre-lab, but it's good conversation to talk about what is it that we're measuring um, and to have conversations about, are you measuring height? Um, are you measuring the mass? And to make those decisions before you even do the experiment. Um, and so it's also neat to talk about quantitative data that you're going to be um, recording, as well as qualitative. Um, and if you want to get super analytical with your students, you can start to see um, it makes sense of maybe the dependent variable is the actual height of the plant, and you would record your results. And I'll show you also how the results are shown here. Um, but also there's qualitative. It looks like this is way more lush. Um, and here it looks like it's more green. Um, and so you would want to make note of those qualitative um, pieces of data as well as quantitative. What's nice is Gizmos also does for you, and they, they actually do the actual data. And they do it in different representations. One is in a table and the other is in a bar graph form. And you also can analyze the line graph form and have great conversations about interpretations of graphs. And for a lot of us uh, in the science field and math field, uh, and I'm sure it's the same in many curriculums, but especially in the American curriculum with NGSS, we really focus on claim evidence and reasoning. And I have some slides that talk about it too, but I'll just mention that it's great to have the students. And this is, by the way, something you can even, without looking at data, get your grade three, four, fives to talk about what is your claim? What is your evidence just from these basics, uh, just from looking at it um, and making observations of this phenomena? Or you can even get to be more specific as you move up in the grade levels to have students um, analyze the quantitative data in the line graphs or in the tables um, and in the bar graphs as well. So as you can see, it's very, very rich. And what's nice is the multiple trials. I can do the experiment again, and I can take a look at the results again. And the students come up with a lot of different observations and conclusions on consistencies, inconsistencies. Um, it's really quite rich, and kids love it. They just love it. Um, you could decide to do the same. You could do maybe and we'll just quickly reset and I'll just do one more just as a quick example. Uh, if I want to reset, maybe, let's see if I want to reset, what do I want to do here? Clear box, there we go. If I want to reset, maybe I just want to do um, tomatoes. Or oh, so actually, you know what, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do beans. So if I do beans, everyone, but now I decide to manipulate the lights. Here, I want to do three lights. Here, I want to do Okay, let me just figure this out here. This is no light. Okay, that's full light. medium light and it's a good point actually too with my students in grade eight I actually encourage them just to do two um, groups so I'm actually going to ignore this third group um, and this is basically more light and less light. And then we talk about which one's going to be your control group and your experimental group. Um, and you could argue that and you could choose, and I, we talk about this with our students too, on the importance of maybe making it more light is your experimental group and then less light is your um, control group. So let's take a look and see what happens. Again, we're ignoring this last box. All right, and you can see now after day 50, there's definitely a difference in height, 51.1 centimeters compared to 41.1 centimeters. Um, when you look at the mass also, you can compare mass and decide if that's going to be your dependent variable, 5.1 compared to 2.4, um, and make sense of that, and then also relate it to the data then too. 
Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of fun manipulations that kids can do. Um, and it's definitely uh, worthwhile uh, to spend time with, with that in the classroom. Um, I actually also, before assigning the summative, which was to actually do your own, your own experiment, um, I shared an actual IB science IA with, with my grade eight class. And I encourage you, if you have grade eight, grade nine, grade 10 students, and if you can access an IB IA, which is called an internal set assessment, um, I spent time to look for common structures and it really gave the kids high, high motivation where they really started to understand how important it is to develop an investigation. And they really understood that it's something that you're gonna develop over the years. And just by doing that, I found I got a lot of buy-in, which of course is also difficult when you're dealing with um, uh, online learning. All right, so our goal is to develop scientific skills to construct investigations. And I just wanna show you now a video um, of a student. Um, and uh, what her final investigation was. And you can kind of see like just from using gizmos and going through the outline of how to develop a formal lab report. And then I mark that using their gizmos as their formal formative. And then um, she came up with the summative of her own. My lab report, video presentation. Upon brainstorming experiments for my lab report, I saw what seemed simple, fleeting, and stimulating. Following these standards, I formed the testable question of, does soaking an apple slice in pure lemon juice create a lower percentage of brownness after being oxidized for 40 minutes? After gathering what I saw as insightful research, I developed my opinion on the outcome of the experiment, or as a scientist say, hypothesis. If an apple slice is soaked in pure lemon juice, then it will create a less percentage of brownness after being oxidized for 40 minutes because lemon is a highly acidic substance with a pH of 2. Substances holding pH levels lower than 3 can deactivate the polyphenol oxidase enzyme, which triggers the process of oxidation, causing the brownness of the exposed apple flesh. Next, I needed to further divide my work by identifying the variables. I did this by asking myself a series of questions. What is the cause? What is being manipulated? By answering these questions, I determined the, the independent variable, which was the presence or absence of pure lemon juice, one squeezed lemon to soak one apple slice. Then, what is the effect? What is being measured or tested? These questions gave me my dependent variable, which was the percentage of brownness on the slice of apple after oxidation for 40 minutes. This was measured with a scale of brownness from zero to five, zero being no brownness and five being dark brown. This was later interpreted into percentages. Yet I still had to answer what was controlled in my experiment. These lied along the lines of the size of the apple slice, the type of apple used, which was red, the temperature of the room or area in which the apple slices are placed. For me, it was 19 degrees Celsius, the inner color of the apple before the oxidation process, and the amount of time each apple is oxidized, 40 minutes. So the experimental group of my lab report would be group A, the slice of apple that was soaked in lemon juice, the control group on the other hand would be group B, which was not soaked in any substance before being oxidized. After trial and error, the experiment satisfied me enough. Thus, I moved on to creating my two graphs. Whilst performing my experiment, I collected data every five minutes up until the 40 minute mark. Both groups started at 0% on the scale of browning. Midway, it reached 0% to 40% for group B, and it ended at 0% for the slice soaked in lemon juice and 60% for the control group. The experimental group had a slope of zero, while the control group had a positive correlation. So if an apple slice is soaked in pure lemon juice, then it will create a less percentage of brownness after it is oxidized for 40 minutes because lemon is a highly acidic substance with a pH of 2. Substances holding pH levels lo lower than 3 can deactivate the polyphenol oxidase enzyme, which triggers the process of oxidation, causing the brownness of the exposed apple flesh. My hypothesis was correct because my by the 40 minute mark, there was a clear evidence that the group which was soaked in lemon juice before the process of oxidation showed a less percentage of brownness than the group which was not soaked in lemon juice. So I hope you can see and appreciate the, the growth um, and uh, 
it's incredible. And this was really one of the first experiences that these students have had in terms of designing their own experiments um, in, a, in a heavy formal way. And uh, really proud of uh, the output of my students and really proud of what they've come up with. Um, and I am, like I said, I'm confident with them and their mathematic, sorry, their scientific skills um, to conduct investigations and move on to high school. Okay, I'm mean, just for the sake of time, I'm kind of running short of time. Um, I just want to hit some math gizmos as well. Um, and I want to show you one of my very favorite math gizmos that I use when I introduce solving systems of linear equations. Um, I just want to show you here quickly. I'm not about creating arithmeticians. I want to create mathematicians. And mathematicians need to describe ph phenomena using mathematical models. And I am super pleased with the opportunity to use gizmos um, where they present many mathematical models. They all tell the same story. They all have a real world context. Um, and they're just poetry in terms of helping students construct their own understandings. And usually um, I finish off with linear equations and I just talk about one line and how that one line is a relationship between two quantities and how algebra is in a relationship between two quantities. And then I move into systems of equations where we look about uh, how there's a system of lines or uh, right, a collection of lines and that there's some meaning that's happening uh, with this, with this uh, point here, this point of intersection. And I leave it at that and I ask the students to make sense of it. And it's just incredible what they come up with. Um, and so I'm just gonna quickly, within hopefully a few minutes, just show you uh, what that looks like. So the idea is cat and mouse, and I usually use um, uh, some, right, I relate it to usually like uh, Tom and Jerry and such. Um, and it's really great to see uh, that this represents the mouse and, and the mouse's speed. It looks like this mouse has a five, um, five foot um, advance start from the cat. This is the cat speed. It looks like this is three minutes. It looks like the mouse speed is four minutes. And if you start to think of, will the cat catch the mouse if the cat goes three feet per second and the mouse goes four feet per second, um, you can start to ask what the student's claim is. Um, and what kind of evidence they have and what kind of reasoning they have. And then you can actually show, and this is so beautiful with the simulation, you can actually show and it says the cat fails to catch the mouse. And it shows that too, and, and we can make sense of that in terms of analyzing the actual graph. Now, if I change that, and if I make the cat speed higher, and I don't want this though, and if I make the cat speed higher and I've got the cat going at 12 and the mouse going at four, of course, common sense says that the cat will catch the mouse because the cat's just going faster. But now we can show a graphical analysis of that too. And we can start to make sense of what does this point mean? And I don't ever tell them what it means. Um, I, I have them play and, and, and understand and try to develop their own conjectures or their own theories of what this point means. And they get to play and they get to see, does the cat catch the mouse? And uh, it looks like the cat will catch the mouse. But before we do that, let's simulate and see. Yep, it's evident. It looks like the cat caught the mouse. It looks like the time it took was 7.50 seconds. Um, and so it's neat to play with and the kids have a ball with this in terms of um, changing the speed of the cat and mouse. And it's so beautiful for me. Like this is again usually my um, rich task that the kids deal with that is accessible, attainable, and, and easy to run. And uh, it's my amazing introduction to um, linear systems. And that that experience of it as we move on to using different methods to solve systems of linear equations, this is always a go-to for us too uh, to make sense of that. And that visual is uh, again it's priceless. Um, so I'm just going to tie it up now, um, and I wish I had more time with you. Time flies. Um, I just want to quickly mention, and I've been mentioning the CER, the idea of claim evidence reasoning. This is a transdisciplinary skill. We want to do this for all secondary graduates to prepare for career in college, and it's using these rich tasks that help us think of what is your claim, what is your evidence, what is your reasoning. In science, 
we think of the reasoning as evidence plus your scientific principles. In mathematics, we think about how your evidence is, um, is important using mathematical models along with uh, mathematical principles. Um, and so um, just maybe to finalize, I just want to assert that using simulations like um, like Gizmos is a really strong formative assessment for me. Uh, it's a super rich task and instruction leads to, I want to call it feed forward, not feedback, because I feel like I'm definitely moving my students forward. Um, and along that, with that, I can ask good guiding questions. There's a lot of strong peer interaction. And, and in the end, um, really, I'm working on those four Cs. There's a lot of critical thinking. Kids have a chance to communicate in breakout routes or with groups or with each other. Um, they're collaborating and they're creating. They're, they're definitely creating as well. So um, again, uh, happiness is solving problems. I'm really excited to move forth and use Gizmos now this year and to take the time to use it so that kids can really construct their, their, their understandings and their skills in both science and math. Hope you enjoyed my presentation.